lecture will cover unconventional fossil fuels. I will describe the difference between these unconventional fossil fuels and the conventional fossil fuels you learned about last week. I will also describe the use of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing and how they're used to produce shale gas and tight oil, as well as the environmental impacts associated with this production. I will also describe other types of unconventional fossil fuels, including tar sands, oil shale, and methane hydrate, and how the energy return on investment differs across the various fossil fuels. What makes an unconventional fossil fuel different than the conventional fossil fuels you learned about previously? Unconventional fossil fuels have not migrated to a trap like conventional oil and gas. Instead, they are still found in the source rock. The source rock is typically low porosity and low permeability, but can be rich in organic matter, which is tightly held in tiny pores that are unconnected. In these settings, the right geological conditions were not met for the petroleum to migrate to a reservoir. This diagram illustrates the differences. The conventional oil and gas are concentrated in pockets called traps. They're outlined in orange on this slide. The diagram also shows several unconventional fossil fuels. Shale gas forms in organic rich black shales where extremely deep burial and extremely high temperatures have broken petroleum down into natural gas, or methane. The natural gas has not migrated to a reservoir rock. This is shown in the red box. Tight gas is similar, but within low permeability sandstones or carbonates. And tight oil, or shale oil, is once again similar, but it is oil and not gas. Tar sands are another unconventional fossil fuel, but they are a bit different. Here they are migrating upwards, but they don't run into a trap before reaching the land surface. We'll talk about each of these in this lecture. One thing to emphasize is that while we call these fuels unconventional fossil fuels, they are increasingly important sources of oil and gas. Here's a diagram showing the production of different gas sources since the year 2000, which is when shale gas production really started to take off. You can see that by 2018, shale and tight gas made up 80% of the natural gas production in the United States. There is a similar pattern in oil production in the US. Tight oil was equal to about 63% of total US crude oil production in 2019. The US is now a net exporter of natural gas and only a small net importer of oil. Where do we find shale gas and tight oil? This map shows you how shale gas is distributed across 35 of the 50 states. But five states accounted for almost 70% of total US natural gas production in 2019. Texas is the largest at 24%, followed by Pennsylvania at 20%, Oklahoma and Louisiana each at 9%, and in fifth place comes Ohio, at 8%. In the US, the three largest tight oil plays are the Permian Basin and Eagle Ford in Texas and the Bakken in North Dakota. Note that these are all shale gas producing regions as well. These tight oil resources are expected to drive any future growth in US oil production. Drilling into conventional sources is like sticking a straw into a jelly donut. The oil and gas are in one large formation and just flow out under pressure. Drilling into unconventional sources is different. Here it's more like tiramisu. The petroleum is in many layers that have to be individually tapped using horizontal or directional drilling and hydraulic fracturing methods to open up the rock. Saudi Arabia has a lot of really big jelly donuts. The United States has a lot of tiramisu, plus some pretty good jelly donuts as well. So because shale gas and other tight gas and oil are held tightly in the source rock, it's not enough to just drill the well and then turn horizontal when you hit the target layer. Porosity and permeability must be created or enhanced by setting off small explosions and fracturing the rock. 
Because of the overlying pressure, a slurry of water, sand, and chemicals are then used to keep the fractures open, hence the term hydraulic fracturing. Note that horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing can be used also for conventional fossil fuels to extend the life of an extraction project. Here's what it looks like on the surface. Directional drilling allows oil and gas production to have a small surface footprint, but a large subsurface extent. These images are just north of Carrollton in Carroll County, Ohio. This site is exploiting gas more than 7,000 feet below the land surface. On the left, you can see the well pad surrounded by farmland and rural houses. On the right, the well pad is shown in red and the green, blue, and yellow dots show the extent of horizontal drilling. One more thing to consider when evaluating shale gas and tight oil is the production of individual wells drops very quickly relative to conventional oil and gas wells. The average decline rate for conventional wells is about 5% per year. In contrast, the average decline rate for fracked and other unconventional wells is 60 to 91% over the first three years, at which point decline slows down into an extended but low level of production. The obvious result of these high decline rates is the need to drill more and more new wells to make up for declining production. And this increases the energy needed to produce these fuels, as well as the environmental consequences of their production and use. Let's discuss these environmental consequences. This graphic shows the typical solution composition used in hydraulic fracturing. The chemical additives are less than half a percent by volume. However, huge volumes are needed in these type of production wells. A typical hydraulic fracturing job uses 3 million gallons of fluid, resulting in 15,000 gallons of chemical waste. Further, the fluids in contact with the shales can pick up brine salts, toxic metals, and radionuclides from the surrounding rock. All of this needs to be pumped out and stored, and possibly reused. Many of the chemicals used in hydraulic fracturing are carcinogenic or associated with other health effects, and these chemicals are needed to keep the fractures open and allow petroleum to be pumped out. What is pumped back out uh, and used in the hydraulic fracturing process is called flowback fluid. Both conventional and fracked wells pump out brine during production. This is called formation water or produced water or just brine. This brine is 92 to 96% of the total wastewater associated uh, with oil and gas production. The large volumes of brine need to be stored and disposed of, creating some potential hazards. We'll talk about the hazards uh, next. This image highlights one of the main potential environmental hazards associated with hydraulic fracturing, and that's methane migration. Faulty well casings or abandoned oil and gas wells, which intersect fractures, may provide a conduit for gas or fluids to migrate upwards and contaminate groundwater, which is a permanent problem. Additional hazards associated with the extraction processes are, first, long-term storage of flowback fluids and produced water, second, habitat fragmentation and stormwater flows during construction activities, third, venting methane directly into the air because methane is a greenhouse gas, and fourth, water withdrawal and competition, especially in drier climates. Finally, Hydraulic fracturing and injection of wastewater has been associated with induced seismic activity, which we'll talk about next. Given the high volumes of produced water and flowback fluids, there has been intense interest in how to deal with this briny and often toxic substance. It can't go into surface waters or aquifers used for drinking water, and it can't be treated by conventional wastewater treatment plants. Some of the water and flowback fluid are recycled and used in the hydraulic fracturing process for future wells, but it can't be recycled infinitely. Eventually, it must be disposed of. One popular solution is to inject it deep underground, well below any aquifers that might be used by humans or connected to surface water. 
However, this has created some problems with induced or human-caused earthquakes or seismic activity. The rise in domestic oil and gas production with the development of unconventional fossil fuels has greatly increased seismic activity in parts of the central U.S., where there are a lot of injection wells. Oklahoma, where produced water and flowback fluid from Texas wells ends up, now has a higher seismic risk than California. Not for the really big earthquakes, but for ones big enough to be felt and to cause damage in a place where buildings and infrastructure were not designed to withstand earthquake shaking. In Ohio, there have been earthquakes in the Youngstown area associated with both fracking itself and with fluid injection. This area is particularly susceptible to induced seismic activity because of the local geology. These earthquakes cause the state to put strict limits on the volume and rate of fluid injection. In places where tight oil is the primary focus of production, there is still some natural gas associated with the oil. It gets brought to the surface along with the sought after oil. Unfortunately, these regions don't have the economic incentives to capture and sell the gas, so they flare or burn it off to get at the more economical oil. This is happening at the same time the shale oil is being targeted in other areas. Flaring gas wastes fossil fuel resources and adds greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Flaring has increased wherever tight oil has been developed. In the US, North Dakota and Texas are the two primary regions where it is an issue. The satellite photo in this slide shows illumination caused by natural gas flaring in the Bakken Shale tight oil play in North Dakota. Note that there are no major cities in that part of North Dakota, but compare the intensity and spread of the illumination to Minneapolis and Denver. There are no federal regulations to limit gas flaring, but states limit it to varying extents. The solutions are increased infrastructure to collect and transport the gas, but the economics have to work in order to make those investments happen. Another major concern with tight oil production is the potential for oil spills and the need to build infrastructure to transport the oil to refineries. Because it is a bit different than conventional crude oil, there are even greater concerns around explosions and leakage associated with tight oil transportation. There has been a particular flashpoint associated with the Bakken shale oil in North Dakota because it wasn't located near existing pipelines or infrastructure. The produced crude oil has been transported on tanker train cars east through Minnesota and other states to where it connects with existing infrastructure increasing risk to communities both close to and far away from the oil fields. The top right image shows a derailment of a Bakken oil train in Alabama that contaminated wetlands along a rail line. There have also been explosions of trains caught carrying Bakken oil. The Dakota Access Pipeline is a nearly 1200 mile long pipeline designed to connect the Bakken tight oil fields over here uh, to a terminal down in Illinois. It was built in 2016 and 2017 amid protests that focused around where the pipeline crosses the Missouri River. The original route crossed north of the state capital of Bismarck and it was rerouted because of concerns about the impact of any spills or leakage on the water supply for the capital city. Instead, it was routed to cross the river just north of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, despite the river serving as the sole source of water for the reservation and the pipeline destroying areas of great cultural significance, including burials protected by federal law. After months of protests and court battles, the pipeline was ultimately built across the river in 2017 with an expedited environmental review. In March 2020, a federal court ruled that the pipeline should be shut down and emptied pending a thorough environmental review. That shutdown order was overturned in August, though the environmental review is expected to continue. Whatever the method of transporting the oil, these concerns are ongoing.